this is obviously something the SEC feels pretty bullish about that they can, um, you know, get these uh, these staking projects and basically push that back to, you know, the legacy banking system. There is a challenge that is coming from digital currencies such as blockchain technologies. So I think it's important to share that anything can be tokenized. All of the money. I like the idea of a gold standard. I mean, it could be used in a very um, cryptocurrency way. Very much sooner than a lot of people understand and think we will be all at a level playing field. Hello. Welcome to the show. This is our second episode of Escape Velocity. Hey, Jimmy, how's it going today? Good, Molly. How's it going? Awesome. I feel like it's uh, like last week, more going on than we ever would have expected. And there's a whole lot of things that we can dig into today. I agree. Seems to be picking up pace. And the interesting thing, too, is, you know, when we were sort of preparing our list of stuff that we wanted to talk about, They all seem kind of connected and related. Like we don't have this list of totally separate things to cover. It just seems like watching the world and the world of money and government type stuff, the geopolitical situation is all unfolding at a rapid rate and it all kind of connects to other parts of it. Would you agree? I do agree. Yeah. Seems like that's exactly what's happening. So let's jump right right into it. Yeah, the first thing that we wanted to dig into is what's going on with the SEC. So how would you kind of describe high level what happened with the SEC and the rest of the world this week? Yeah, so uh, the SEC is continuing what is like a shock and awe campaign against uh, crypto and digital assets. Uh, A lot of us, you know, the, the XRP community members have been living with this now since December of 2020. Uh, But over the past, you know, three months, really going back into the latter part of 2022, SEC has uh, really ramped up pressure across the board, a bunch of different projects, exchanges and projects specifically. Uh, Most recently, you know, yesterday they issued a Wells notice for uh, for Coinbase and Coinbase has come out. Brian Armstrong's come out, the CEO, and responded to that. Um, what is a Wells notice for people who don't know what that means? Yeah, good question. So uh, this came about in the early 70s. Uh, there was a, a discussion and in, in really there was a like SEC commission that uh, kind of came to a determination that any time at the conclusion of an investigation, if you were going to bring some type of enforcement action against a firm or a person, for violation of securities laws, there should be some type of notice uh, given to them whenever possible. Okay. So, um, you know, if it's not like there's a risk of them fleeing the country or something, you know, like that, uh, they should they should get a notice, and then you have 30 days to respond. I think the chairman of that committee uh, that that kind of came up with this was was his name was Wells, and so it became called a Wells mm-hmm. notice. So, you get one, and you basically have 30 days to uh, to respond. Uh, 30 days kind of tracks normal uh, banking procedure type things, like when you get notices from, you know, lenders or creditors and it's, uh, you know, you have 30 days to respond about a certain change in your terms of, of your credit card or whatever. Um, so it, it follows that kind of reasonable time frame of having 30 days to respond. Um, Do they like make an accusation in this Wells notice that you have to sort of say whether or not you did or did not do the thing? Like, what do you respond uh, to? Yeah, so typically there is a, a little bit of color on um, you know what, what the violations they're claiming have occurred. Um, it, I think Coinbase is coming out and, and basically saying the, um, the Wells notice that they've received is very vague and, and they really don't know exactly what they're alleging. They think it relates to their staking program, which was, I think, called Earn. And then there's a couple of other related programs that they had on platform. They think that's what it's about. Uh, Coinbase is in a very bizarre position uh, in, in now that the SEC is, is turning towards them. Uh, first of all, they, they went public, and, and uh, Coinbase is saying this right now. You know, They went public in April of 2021 and had a very robust comment period of their, their registration statement, their S1, uh, with the SEC. And um, I think they said something like 57 times within their registration statement, they talk about 
staking. Um, and it was never, you know, during that time brought to their attention that uh, that that could be some violation of the securities laws. I'll remind everybody that Coinbase also filed an amicus brief in the uh, SEC v. Ripple case, basically supporting the fair notice defense piece of Ripple's um, Ripple's defense. So um, kind of not not doing a Howey test analysis and, and determining whether XRP was a security, but more focusing on uh, even if it was determined that XRP is a security, that Ripple didn't have fair notice. And really no one in the industry has had fair notice. <clears throat> now, why do they think staking programs are securities? What's the deal there? So, um, you, you, you know, the, it, it goes into a, you know, Howie Reeves type analysis. Uh, you know, promissory notes are in, in debt instruments of, of that nature are considered securities. They're, they're not, that's not even like an investment contract. That's like in the definition of the laundry list of things that are considered securities in the statute. Uh, so the Reeves test kind of looked at, you know, there are certain, there are certain attributes of things, you know, that are notes uh, that make them more like a currency and less like an investment. Uh, and I think in Reeves, and I haven't, I haven't referred to Reeves in a, in a while. I know you and I have talked about this before. I need to go back and read it. But um, basically, I think it was if it was under nine months, if basically the thing was was maturing uh, within nine months, uh, that was more like. It was less like a, a security, less like an investment being held for investment purposes. Okay. Obviously, currencies were trading those all the time, right? The, the Federal Reserve note is a promissory note. It's just in that currency form, uh, and we're you know literally using that for for goods and services all the time, um, both physically so, and, and electronically. So the idea then is that if I'm staking, I'm essentially lending my money. And if I'm lending it for more than nine months, then it is essentially like a long-term loan for interest, which become is a security. Yeah, and and this all there, there's the other thing that the Reeves test does is it presumes whatever the thing is that's being analyzed to determine it presumes, right. and and the presumption is rebuttable, but it presumes that it is a security. So, uh, you know, if you're if you're in a Reeves test type analysis, you're kind of behind the eight ball already because the presumption is that it is a security. And so you're going to have to bring evidence to rebut that presumption and basically level the playing field again. Um, so anyway, not not sure what exactly uh, uh, the SEC is going to claim with respect to Coinbase in the staking, but obviously that's what they hit uh, Kraken for as well. I think Kraken settled back in February for $30 million and then agreed to cease their staking programs, their U.S. staking programs. So um, this is obviously something the SEC feels pretty bullish about, that they can um, you know, get these, uh, these staking projects and basically push that back to you know, the legacy banking system. So do you think that's the end goal here is they just want to make it a smaller playground of who is able to offer these staking programs? Um, well, I mean, more, more to the point, do I, I think they are 100% directing these activities back to the entities that have traditionally performed these types of services. For example, NASDAQ has just come out saying that they're going to have a crypto uh, custody you know, portion of their platform, right? Uh, so they're just they're, they're setting up for basically having all the exchange of uh, crypto assets or digital assets happening on, on the NASDAQ exchange. Uh, I'm, I'm sure New York Stock Exchange is going to do the same thing. Uh, you're seeing Fidelity uh, come out and provide a, a digital asset, not only kind of custodial, but, you know, trading type services to their clients. Uh, most people don't know this. Fidelity actually rolled this program out in 2020, right at the time, um, right right after the start of the pandemic. So in the spring of 2020, uh, Fidelity rolled out their digital asset platform. And it was really weird. M most people didn't know about it, even within Fidelity, <laughs> that they had done it. 
and they were just mm -hmm. offering that service to uh, to institutions and, and high net worth individuals at that time. But recently, Fidelity has started to offer that to uh, you know more traditional four hundred one k you know IRA type um, investment holdings by regular people like you and me. Hmm. All right. So what else happened with the SEC this week? We saw these celebrity influencers get charged. That's right. And I think it's a little bit funny that yeah, some of them are, are not traditionally who you would look at for investment advice. So one of the sort of favorites on my list was Lindsay Lohan, who generally is not perceived as an investment advisor around anything, let alone digital assets. So do you think it's sort of out of line for the SEC to accuse? Well, I guess the issue was that she was promoting something without disclosing that she had received payment in exchange, which yeah. happens all the yeah. time. Anytime you are a sponsor. I think it's called touting is what they, the, like technical term that they try to get these influencers on. You know, this is, um, in, 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 in my humble opinion, this is just easy, easy deal making for uh, Gary Gensler. So he goes to the Hollywood crowd he basically says, you know, you made like with Kim Kardashian, I think she made like a million five or something on her touting that she had done. I can't remember what project that was. Might have been Luna. But um, anyway, it's like pay us a million three and you know, we'll agree right now. And we, you know, and you basically get to be they get to be like Martha Stewart now. You know, they, they've like uh, had some you know brush with the Securities and Exchange Commission and settled it out. It like makes them. Uh, Martha Stewart was on the Today Show uh, yesterday morning. It was National Puppy Day, and she was like, you know, taking the dogs around and stuff. So it's like, you know, it, it, these are uh, these are like ridiculous uh, things to even occur. They, they're all buttoned up before we ever even hear about it, uh, and it seems to just be promoting uh, the celebrities. On one hand, they get to kind of look like they're kind of edgy. Oh, you know had a brush with the SEC. Uh, Gensler and the SEC get to basically hold out these poster childs uh, for, you know, these influencers that they were able to, you know, bring to task and, you know, comply with the securities laws. And it's all just like a, a sham. It's a show. Meanwhile, they're destroying this entire, uh, this entire industry. Uh, many, many, many companies, you know, and we're starting to see more and more people uh, that are kind of the legacy, you know, blockchain industry groups and stuff like that are starting to understand now the ramification of what the government's actions have really been. They're starting to talk about this stuff in terms of takings and violations of the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution and things like that. It's like, yeah, we've been talking about this for over two years. And because it, was, it's probably because it was Ribble and XRP, nobody cared, right? They're like, oh yeah, that's that's a problem. I think it'll probably put an end to the celebrity endorsing via Twitter because how are you going to possibly put your no, disclosure or disclaimer in a tweet? There just won't be the real estate for it. No, it won't. Once this is once this goes back to, uh, you know, once they succeed in in basically giving this this asset class back to the legacy banking system and the legacy, you know, money managers then the money managers will be hiring these celebrities and nothing will ever happen. It, it's, this is, this is not going to stop this. This is going to uh, push this in the direction of the people who actually, you know, support the SEC. Doesn't seem like a system with much integrity if you're just prosecuted when you don't support the incumbent's agenda at that moment. Well, I mean, welcome to the war. It's that that's that's going on across the board from from all you know regulatory agencies right now. Um, and I and I hope the judicial system ends up pushing back on some of this stuff. The other news uh, that was related to this um, is the New York Attorney General has brought this action against uh, KuCoin, which is an exchange, saying that they violated New York securities laws and that Ethereum is a security under under New York law. So we've got this very interesting thing starting to happen. We, you know, obviously this past week we had all the hoopla about Trump and is he going to get arrested? And it was a New York attorney general that was bringing 
bringing, you know, that action before a grand jury and trying to get an indictment from a grand jury. Um, and it was really all federal matters that, that were in question. So um, we're starting to have this odd thing where the state of New York is stepping in and trying to basically prosecute federal actions that the federal government itself is not willing to bring or is somehow handicapped in bringing. For example, you know, all of us know about EthGate and, and we know about the, the Ethereum uh, free pass speech that Bill Hinman gave back in 2018. So that's fair notice gold uh, for, for consensus, Ethereum, uh, all the people who were trading, uh, you know, all these people who are, um, who were shorting XRP and trading on Ethereum back in the 2018, 2019 timeframe, Galaxy Digital, Mike, they were all doing this with inside information. The problem was that since it wasn't regulated, they couldn't, it can't bring insider trading. But if all this stuff is securities, then they're all guilty of insider trading. So it's, um, it's an interesting thing. But back to this federal state issue, uh, you know, Ethereum and consensus have a, a wonderful case against the SEC for fair notice because they actually had an SEC official walk on stage and declare that Ethereum was not a security, specifically by name, and then do a roadshow, you know, a, a media tour, CNBC and, and all these other places, basically saying they don't think Ethereum is a security. So that's that's fair notice gold. I mean, that, that is a, a thing that you, you kind of can't undo. But for the state to bring that action, well, didn't see that coming, you know. And this also ties into, uh, you know, the, the state securities laws are these what, what we call blue sky laws, right? That really our federal securities law system was built on top of those that have, um, you know, read through the, the different pleadings and motions in the SEC v. Ripple case are all familiar now because it's, it's very well discussed in Ripple's uh, motion for summary judgment that, um, you know, the... the the, the laws, the federal securities laws and the, the concept of investment contract was taken from the blue sky laws that existed at that time. And, and an investment contract was commonly thought of based on the precedent from these, these state uh, blue sky laws. So um, it's almost what are like- blue sky laws? Well, it's the state securities laws. And so, how, why does the state have to have different security laws in the federal government? Yeah, so every state has their own, you know, they've got, the, they've adopted the UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code, and then they also have, you know, their version, I think it's Article 8, is a whole system of, of securities laws, uh, you know, how you use them for collateral, how you, you know, hypothecate them, all, all this different stuff, and there's a, a, a framework at the state level um, that is not unlike the federal level that you can't, you know, you can't engage in fraud or misrepresentation in connection with securities transactions in the state. Now, basically, the federal securities laws has been deemed to basically preempt the state securities laws if you follow certain, um, certain processes. For example, if you comply with Section 5 of the federal securities laws, which requires the registration of any offer or sale of a security. So that's when people go public, they file an S1. It's, you know, it's what Coinbase did, right? It was reviewed and commented by, um, by the SEC. And ultimately, the SEC says, okay, this is good to go. You've got all the disclosures. You've got all the audited financials, all the materials that an investment, an investor would need to make an a investment decision. Um, so there's that way, or you can do a private placement uh, under Section 4. So if it's not, you know, a public offering to, you know, non-accredited investors and it's a private offering to big kids, either qualified institutional buyers or what we call accredited investors, then you can do that as a private placement. You don't have to register that offer and sale of securities. Uh, they are restricted. They have legends on them. There are certain holding periods and things like that that have to be complied with before they can kind of be dribbled out into the public. But um, 
To perfect that, you, you file what's called a Form D. Uh, regulation D is basically a regulation of the Security and Exchange Commission that, that kind of uh, builds out the, uh, the, the private placement concept that's in Section 4 of, of the Securities Act. And so you file a Form D, that perfects your private placement, and then that preempts all the state securities laws. Some people, some attorneys advise clients to not only file the Form D with the SEC, but to file it in all the states where you have uh, investors. Um, that's, that's typically not always done because it's kind of like if you've complied with the private placement um, uh, you know, regulations and statute, you should be good, almost irrespective of whether you filed the Form D or not. Um, but it's kind of like good hygiene to perfect that by filing the Form D. So anyway, there is this interaction to this day between the state and federal securities laws. I feel like I just got another law school Jimmy class lesson today. Yeah, yeah. No, you're welcome. Hey, for free. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about some geopolitical stuff. The yeah. Xi Putin leaked audio. Do you think that was kind of done on purpose? Do you think that was just sending a message or an accident? What was your take? Oh, the, the leaked audio is 100% done on purpose. Um, okay. so, so leaked is a generous term. Yeah, leaked. Staged, maybe is the, 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 <laughs> the appropriate term. Uh yeah, it, I mean, it, it had to be translated and everything, right? So uh, it had to be translated. Yeah. It, was, it was translated initially, I assume, in Russian, and somebody you know did the good work of translating it into English as well. So, um, look, this is for anybody who's been paying attention to what's been happening in the world for the past three years. This is it's all the culmination of this, you know moving away from the uh, petrodollar and moving basically the world back to a gold standard uh, level playing field. And this has been going on uh, among you know China and Russia and the Middle East for, for a number of years now. They've been making big, big steps. Uh, the really fascinating thing about you know this leak or what they said uh, was, was that it really kind of represents to me the conclusions, like everything's done now. Uh, and, you know, at the same time, we've got China basically stepping in the shoes of what used to be the U.S.'s role of brokering peace deals in the Middle East. So you've got, you've got Saudi Arabia and Iran are uh, reopening uh, diplomatic relations. That deal occurred in Beijing, it was brokered by China. And as part of that deal, uh, Saudi Arabia and Syria are going to reopen their uh, relative um, embassies in each other's countries. So, you know, Saudi Arabia had, had basically been, uh, uh, they had ceased diplomatic relations with Syria for about a decade. So we're seeing peace in the Middle East being driven by China. Uh, Russia, as part of that, you know, uh, visit, was announcing that they were willing to uh, trade in hydrocarbons uh, in the digital, sorry, in the yuan, uh, which is China's currency. So um, we're, we're definitely having, uh, uh, you know, two thirds of the world's population is, is going on to this, you know, Juan Ruble BRICS alliance standard. Uh, it's rumored that I think Mexico is going to join BRICS. It's rumored mm -hmm. that Germany could, could join BRICS as well. Uh, and if Germany were huge. to do that, yeah, they're, they're the wealthiest company, country, Freudian slip there. <laughs> They're the wealthiest country in in the the European Union, and it would it, that would destroy the the EU. So is uh, Germany yeah, a corporation like the U.S.? Yeah, they're all corporations, uh, and and so the 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 thinking uh, amongst you know many people that we we talk to is that these are all you know going back to republics, uh, and that that will happen you know all in one fail swoop, but. We're just seeing, I think we're now seeing kind of, this is like the ninth inning of the game. And, um, you know, the West, think about, you know, like the NATO countries, you know, Europe, European Union, uh, Canada, and um, 
and the United States uh, seem to be kind of on the wrong side of this. Japan is part of that. They just had the Japanese uh, prime minister uh, visited Ukraine. If you want to know who's on whose side, you look to see who goes and like visits Zelensky in Ukraine and gives him an Oscar, or gives him some gift or something, uh, you know, flies the we stand with Ukraine flag. And then you can see who basically goes to visit Russia or who China is basically putting together. Russia just forgave a, a many African nations. I think it's like $20 billion in debt that they forgave um, in Africa. So um, it seems like Africa is, is going uh, the way of BRICS. Obviously, so- South Africa is already a member of BRICS. So, yeah, interesting time. And while on the West, we're having this banking crisis. So it looks like Deutsche Bank is next on the list. So it's Friday afternoon and all day long there's been chit chat on Twitter that Deutsche Bank's in trouble. So you think that's the next domino to fall? I do. Uh, Deutsche was down, I think, 14 and a half percent at its worst on like, their Friday. So it's currently Friday afternoon, central time uh, here in the U.S., um, and, and that contagion is spreading to, uh, there's a, a German bank called Commerzbank that's starting to, to have trouble. They traded down significantly. And then France's uh, Societe Generale uh, also was trading down significantly. So, um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of concerns about what happened with uh, the, the UBS and Credit Suisse deal um, that, you know, basically that the, the, the Swiss government has effectively nationalized the Swiss banking system, as I was riding into the office this morning, I was kind of pondering that in my head. I mean, think about how many Swiss bank accounts, you know, and you've got uh, cartels, you know, that is the ultimate secret bank account is to, to have a Swiss bank account. And uh, all that information and all of your funds have effectively been nationalized uh, by the Swiss government at a time when, you know, uh, the West is basically saying uh, that, that um, there are certain Swiss bankers and certain bankers in the U.S. that have been helping Russian oligarchs and avoid the, uh, the Swift sanctions that they've been trying to impose against Russia. So uh, it's a chess match. It's, it's fascinating to see all this play out. There's another thesis, too, that I learned from Tom Longo months ago that lo- kind of looks at this war on crypto and Credit Suisse from a little bit of a different angle and that his belief, which I actually agree with, is the Fed and Powell and even J.P. Morgan have split from the traditional banking cartel that we, he affectionately refers to as Davos, but just refers to the European banking oligarchy that has been in place for centuries, primarily based out of the city of London, and that this sort of split in the faction has kind of created this war over control of the dollar, which is right now control of the money. And that's why his belief is that Powell and the Fed have been raising rates not to deal with inflation at all, but to collapse the offshore dollar markets, which are affectionately referred to as the euro dollar market, as well as crypto. FTX are mechanisms that you can use to fractionally reserve bank and increase the supply of dollars globally. The Fed does not have any control over those. They don't have control over banks in the Caribbean or they didn't have control over FTX or even Credit Suisse. So these attacks on these recent crypto entities as well as Credit Suisse are part of this war between Davos and the Fed to restore control of the banking system to the United States. It also ties into this split between SOFR and LIBOR, which are these ex- mechanisms where the exchange rates are set. And traditionally, they were set globally <coughs> from LIBOR, which is based out of London, and that the United States has kind of split from that and now has their own interest exchange mechanism via SOFR, which is kind of offi- like symbolically an official split from the Bank of England and the banking system based in Europe, uh, where we as Americans thought that the Revolutionary War ended back in 1776, but... For all intents and purposes, we still have been under the Bank of England in some capacity for a long time via SOFR or via LIBOR. And now this sort of switch to SOFR is kind of an independence Hmm. movement. Yeah, that's that's an interesting theory. 
And like Silicon Valley Bank, for example, was part of that Davos cartel. You can sometimes tell who plays on that team by the level of their wokeness in their uh, <laughs> political decisions. And SVB had a lot of very woke qualities to it, which is an yeah, indicator that it was really altruism, used. right? Wasn't that his his major uh, major initiative? That was a Sam Bankman Fried was an effective altruist, which is quite an arrogant uh, way to say that we're it's better off if I have all the money because I will decide how to spend it um, mm -hmm. versus anyone else having those decisions. So basically, this arrogance of these few billionaires deciding that they were going to oppress everyone else because <laughs> their ability to protect the future of mankind was um, greater, better. I'm not a, f a fan of the effective altruism movement at all. I think it's very arrogant. Where does, uh, you said Tom is, is the person who has this theory? Um, Tom where Longo? does he, Yeah, Tom Longo. Where does he see this kind of going? I think he sees a kind of breakup of the globalist structure and will probably have a very U.S. central economy. Um, the BRICS nations will kind of do their own thing as, as well. You know, we had this globalist entity that was controlled out of the European banking cartel. The dollar was the, the means of paying for everything. The U.S. military served as the global cop on the beat to protect those interests. And so we had to break that up. And we'll probably have more smaller factions as everyone kind of repairs from that. Um, mm -hmm. I actually think it's going to be great for the United States. I'm a massive advocate of small businesses and would love to see more manufacturing in the United States where mm -hmm. right now U.S. manufacturers can't really compete globally because of the strong dollar. So this, mm -hmm. I think, will suck a little bit because a lot of the cheap stuff that we're used to getting from overseas won't be as readily available, but it will give the U.S. manufacturing sector, which was a lot of jobs and a lot of people who really liked those jobs and wanted to, that was part of their identity, that could be part of this resurgence. And we're also seeing this cool AI movement at the same time. So a lot of the crappy manufacturing roles can be done by machines at this point. And so it will just really allow U.S. manufacturing to compete in a new way. And it will allow other countries in the world not to be held into this dollar debt system, which becomes a prison of sorts. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, that's that's consistent with with our theory for the past few years uh, that it was going to break down into kind of this multipolar world. It's clearly what uh, Russia and China are trying to to bring about, uh, and it's interesting to see. Uh, I guess the, these different factions of the of the West uh, start to kind of turn on each other and and right. you know uh, uh, battle it out for for you know different kind of perspectives. Um, yeah, it'll, it's going to be interesting. So, yeah, we'll see. I don't. I don't think we got too much longer to wait. You know, um, what else did sort we want to cover? Domino yeah. situations that, like, how many banks have to fall before it's sort of deemed a big problem? So mm -hmm. we've seen Credit Suisse and now Deutsche Bank. How so many you know, a couple hours, hours, couple hours before we came on here, uh, Janet Yellen has called an emergency meeting of the financial regulators. Um, so, and then we're, we, it was just yesterday, right? There was, or two days ago that the fed raised rates by a quarter of a basis point. Um, and then the week prior, the European union had raised rates by half a point. So inflation is still not under control. Um, we've got, you know, with these BRICS nations and this multipolar world starting to develop outside the United States, all those dollars are coming home and are going to continue to drive our inflation rate, you know, pretty high. This is the dollar milkshake theory that we've talked about before. Mm -hmm. um, so as these dollars come home to roost, we're going to have to, um, we're going to have to figure out how to stabilize our economy. And I think it's going to ultimately result in a return to some type of an asset backed system. I mean, it's creating the perfect condition where you have one currency that is now losing its value. If, if I come along and say, hey, I'll swap you the old one for the new one, I'm going to give you a good deal and the new one's going to be worth more. It's going to be difficult for people to not be excited about a way to get out of the failing currency and into something mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. I guess the question is, what do you do with all the dollar denominated debts, you know, mortgages, credit cards, student loans, all this stuff? Um, do you, if, if you're departing 
the fiat system completely? Do you have to have some type of a debt jubilee and, um, you know, cross the board and basically relieve people of those, those burdens? Cause now, now, you know, it's completely worthless. I mean, if you got to the point of severe hyperinflation, like Weimar Germany level, I mean, at that point, the debt is sort of doesn't really exist because you could pay it off with a tiny amount of the new gold backed currency or asset backed currency. Right. And that's, you know, that's what a lot of these, um, <laughs> you know, there's a, a, a movement like this state national American national movement that uh, they are, they are paying off their, uh, that while well, they're discharging their, their debts with real, uh, you know, coins that hold gold or silver in it. And um, it's, it's an interesting thing to see what's happened. I've been looking into it. I haven't quite figured it out myself, but uh, this, this all seems like it's kind of coming together. It's a perfect storm, I think, to create conditions to transition to a new system. Yeah, for sure. For many reasons, right? There won't just be like the one reason. It's the debt problem. Right. We have this geopolitical tension around the dollar being the dominant currency, or the rise of digital assets. <laughs> Yeah, you know, JP Morgan, I think, has come out, I think it was yesterday, and, and basically said that a blockchain needs to be adopted and crypto basically technology needs to be adopted in order to preserve the ability to make payments in fiat. Um, so that's, uh, they're, they're all, you, know, you got NASDAQ, you got JP Morgan, uh, everybody's kind of jumping in now, you know, the water's warm. Uh, but as you say, it's like a perfect storm. The tricky thing that people want to know, and, and I get asked this regularly, is how soon will this play out? So if you wanted to venture into that very risky water, Jimmy, what would you say in terms of, are we looking at weeks, months, years to this transition happens? Yeah. So I'm notoriously early on all this stuff. You know, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I would have thought this all would have been done, you know, a while ago. And then back in July, I think I thought it was okay by November, it's done. Um, we, we knew we had to see this banking collapse narrative or, you know, period happen. I mean, for this truly to kind of go to zero, you, you, you had to, you had to see all this stuff start to implode. And so now that we're in the throes of that, you know, I believe we, we've got to be, if we're, if we're switching, I, I believe we got to be, you know, very close to, to, to the switch over. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe Secretary Yellen is, is telling Gary Gensler right now, it's time to uh, drop that ripple lawsuit and everybody needs to go and buy up the rest of the XRP so that we can still keep trade moving, and keep cash flowing. Um, but who knows? I always have optimism on Fridays that the big thing will happen on a Friday. So every Friday morning, it's like, maybe this is the Friday. Yeah. Maybe it's happening so, now. Maybe. Yeah. We've been recording this. The, the whole, this lawsuit could have been settled and we wouldn't even know. It wouldn't settle. That's right. That seems like something, uh, you know, when I was in the, in the legal business, we uh, sometimes strategically <laughs> drop a bunch of documents on the other side, uh, you know, at, at 5 PM on a Friday, we call it a, a drop and run. So basically like, you know, don't let them screw up your weekend, you know, screw, screw theirs, that type of a thing. And this was, this was all, you know, fair, fair play in, in, in warfare of corporate transactions, but uh, yeah, maybe they'll do a 5 PM drop and run on us. <laughs> maybe. Well, we did hear that if there ever were bail-ins, like major banking collapse bail-ins that right. they would happen over a weekend because they need a couple of days yep. to do it. Yep. Yep. So. And uh, you know, wouldn't, well, didn't we just have a holiday weekend? What was it? It, it was uh, like two weekends ago or something. I can't remember. It's been spring break. Um, so. All right. You want to do our memes? We got a bunch memes. of memes. Let's do memes. So we had this plan. We were going to do four memes. We did that successfully one week. And now this week we had so many that we have six. And they're and good. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who voted last week. That was fun to watch. Yeah, we had, you know, we had like 10,000 votes on these memes. That, that's pretty awesome. Views, but yes. Oh, 2,000 views? I thought it maybe it was 9,000 votes. How many votes were there? 
I think a couple hundred. I don't know if there was oh, okay. that many. All right. Well, I must have read that wrong. Um, uh, but we would love this week. Maybe we'll have 10,000 votes. Maybe this week we'll have 10,000. Well, should I kick it off? Yes. Yeah, so, so what is the first meme that you... So the first have? meme uh, ties into exactly what we've been talking about uh, with the whole China-Russia thing. But it's a, it's a uh, picture of Xi. It's a newspaper article that says uh, the CIA uncovers Chinese plot to just sit back and enjoy the collapse of the United States. Uh, so, I mean, ties in exactly what we're talking about here. Shows uh, President Xi looking quite relaxed, sitting in a nice Isn't there a chair. famous art of war quote that kind of relates to that? There, there is. It's do not interrupt your enemy enemies when they're busy destroying themselves. I thought of that quote when I first saw that meme. Yeah, it's a good one. All right, my first meme is one of the graphics or whatever symbols that I often find amusing in, in memes. And a child, a five-year-old, I guess asks a parent, I wish I had infinity dollars to give to people. And the responsible parent replies, well, that would wreck the economy. And sure enough, you have the Federal Reserve looking a little bit, you know, guilty as charged. Concerned. Yeah, <laughs> a little sketchy. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. All, All right, right so next. my next one, uh, obviously, uh, Credit Suisse uh, has just effectively been nationalized, you know, or, you know, their merger with uh, with UBS. And so it shows a, a picture of uh, Winnie the Pooh uh, as, as Credit Suisse, and it's got like a, a the normal Swiss kind of plus looking sign, probably a cross, right? And then the next one down shows Winnie the Pooh in a suit and it says debit Suisse <laughs> and it's got a negative sign. So uh, funny, That's a good funny one. stuff. All right. My next one is a group of people in like an office meeting and one guy in kind of a cartoon bubble says, how do we bring inflation down? And the <laughs> people at the, in the meeting have different options or suggestions. One guy is let them eat bugs. Second one says, lock them at home. And the third one says, stop creating money to bail out banks. You see these sort of angry look from the guy speaking and they throw the guy who suggested the stop bailing out banks out the window. Yeah. yeah. So they're like, yeah, hey, we don't like your guy. suggestion. You should go away. Yeah, the smart guy needs to go. That's funny. All right, my next one is... Uh... <laughs> Uh, so obviously, uh, with, with these bail-ins, bailouts, all this stuff that's starting to happen, this great uh, discussion that we were talking about um, yesterday between the uh, Oklahoma senator and Janet Yellen about you know community mm -hmm. bank, Oklahoma, Texas, Georgia having to bail out you know Silicon Valley Bank. So it shows a, a, a patron of the bank kind of coming in, and instead of them holding up the bank, the bank's sticking a gun in their face and saying, "Give us, give us your money." There was actually a funny Babylon B article this week too about how it's obviously parody, but saying that banks were now calling up their clients, their depositors, to raise money, see if they wanted to lend the bank money. Right. Right, yeah. <coughs> All right, my last meme is actually one I'm kind of proud of, but it's uh, the Dos Equis guy who often does very funny, the most memes interesting man, lends, world's most interesting man, himself to that. And this was really relating to the SEC suing these influencers. And it says, I don't always take investment advice, but when I do, it's from Lindsay Lohan. Naturally. I yes. mean, who doesn't need a, a mean girl as an investment advisor, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to put a poll up on Twitter like we did last week, and you can vote for which one you liked the best. And Jimmy and I will duke it out to see which of us gets to win the the meme competition for this week. <laughs> Good luck, Molly. I think yours won last week. One of yours won last I week. I did. Right? I was quite proud was, of that accomplishment. It was did, close, did crypto, though. Did, you know? It was. Yeah. Well, that JP Morgan one was was way out in front for, for most of the time. And then all of a sudden, people, uh, I don't know. It's almost like somebody put their thumb on the scale. I don't know. <laughs> That's a bold accusation to make. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not making any accusations. Anyway, All right. So luck. any parting words, part of parting words for anybody watching this about what's going on in the world this week? 
No, I think uh, like my message, my, my parting message last week, you know, enjoy time with your family this weekend, you know, hug everybody, send the love around and uh, we'll be back next week. Yeah, I think this show continues to be very exciting. It does feel at times like we are watching theater. And one thing that I like about that viewpoint is it helps you can stay emotionally detached from it. And sometimes watching like the banking system collapse could be a stressful, anxiety inducing experience. So if you have the view of like, you know what, this is just a show we're watching, let's get some popcorn and enjoy it, it can help kind of get through this season without kind of getting wrapped up in the pendulum and the turmoil of it. It's good advice. All right, we will see you all next week. See you later.